Okay, so welcome to Unit 4, which will be all about how to create an agent-based model from the ground up. And we're going to be talking about how to design that model, how to build it and create it, and how to analyze the results of that model. In many ways, this unit was the core of what caused uh, me and Uri uh, Walensky to write the textbook on agent-based modeling that is a companion to this course. We have been teaching a workshop around this unit, this chapter, uh, which is chapter four in the textbook, uh, for a while, and we really got inspired on the basis of that to actually teach a, to write a textbook on the topic. Um, but before we get to all the details about how to actually build the model, uh, let me talk a little bit about why, um, what uh, some guidelines to think about while creating a model. So um, this is a, a quote that I've always loved uh, ever since Uri actually introduced me to it. It was written on uh, Richard Feynman's blackboard around the time of his death. Um, and basically, the basic idea is that it says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. I know how to solve every problem that has been solved. Uh, in other words, you need to be able to think about how you're going to create um, the results of, the, of, of, of a problem, the results to a problem, in order to fully understand it. And this is actually um, a core of something that's sometimes called generative science. Um, and you, you saw um, Rob Extell and uh, uh, Josh Epstein also say something similar when they said, if you didn't grow it, you didn't show it. Um, uh, you know, or you don't know it, as it's sometimes phrased as well. Um, and the idea is that in order to truly, truly understand how a, pro how a phenomenon works, how it exists, we really need to know what generates that, right? Just knowing the solution is not enough. We need to know uh, what causes it. And that is the key to creating agent-based models. And agent-based models, we're often posing a problem and then or a, a question we have about the way the world works. And then we're asking what are the rules that can generate that pattern of behavior, that system that creates those uh, things that we're interested in, that phenomenon we're interested in. So given that context, there are three major steps toward uh, creating a generative model, creating an agent-based model that will generate the patterns of behavior that reflect what you'd like to see. And these steps are pretty obvious. You know, one is design the model, two is build the model, and then three is analyze the model, right? Um, and that might seem pretty obvious, um, and, but I should point out, and the reason why I list these is because even though they're listed on this slide as being in like an iterative order, in many respects, they actually feed back on each other. So we'll start designing the model, then maybe we'll play around for a little while, and then we'll go back to doing some more design, and then maybe we'll finally have something that we want to analyze, we'll analyze it, we'll realize we've left something out, go back to design and build and so forth, right? So you should think of these, even though they're uh, separated out in this way, uh, as being kind of uh, is, um, somewhat interconnected, right? Um, and so they really kind of help you uh, come through and build the model you want. In that respect, you know, with respect to agent-based modeling in the textbook, we kind of lay out what we call two different design methods that occur with an agent-based model. Um, probably the, more, the easier one to understand, the one that's more relevant to other types of modeling is phenomenon-based modeling. In this framework, you know the basic characteristic or reference pattern that you want to model, right? So for instance, in uh, the flocking model, you know that you want to get these flocks of birds, right? In a uh, wolf sheep predation model, for instance, that uh, Uri discussed in his lecture, you know you want to have these certain populations of wolf and sheep be um, constant throughout, right? Um, in uh, the, the uh, shelling model, the tipping model, right, there was this pattern of segregation that was rampant throughout society and you want to make sure you have that. Another way that's kind of somewhat unique to agent-based modeling, though it, it exists in forms and other types of modeling as well, is exploratory modeling. And this is actually very common among uh, computer modeling in general, which is you want to start with a basic set of mechanisms and then explore what those mechanisms generate, right? So let's imagine that we just, that rather than trying to look at a uh, wolf sheep pattern of populations, instead we just write rules for wolves and we write wolves for sheep, and then we explore what comes out of that, right? Um, or, you know, in the, um, in the segregation model, right, rather than trying to assume that there's going to be segregation, um, Shelley had started by writing the rules for these individual agents. And in many respects, that's what he did, right, uh, to exploit that phenomenon. So, um, in exploratory modeling and phenomenon-based modeling, they're not um, 
mutually exclusive modeling approaches, right? A lot of times we kind of go back and forth between these. Another dimension that we sometimes consider when thinking about agent-based modeling design is top-down versus bottom-up design. Now, uh, this is in some ways parallel to phenomenon-based uh, versus exploratory modeling, uh, but it's a little bit distinct. So, almost all agent-based models are bottom-up in terms of the model. And what I mean by that is that we write these low-level rules of behavior, those level of rules of behavior aggregate, and then they create a top-level pattern of behavior that emerges from the low-level rules. But design can actually be approached from either a bottom-up or a top-down approach. Um, and uh, so from a top-down approach, right, you might want to start with thinking about what are my major components of design and then put them together, right? Uh, and in some ways, this is kind of a very deliberated, um, formalistic approach to designing your model. Another way is to think about it from a bottom-up standpoint, right? So this might be that, like, for instance, I start with some basic components, I start thinking about how they interact, and then I add another component over here, then I need another component over here. And in many ways, what this means is that the conceptual model and the code co-evolve. In other words, that design model stage and that build model stage are much more closely related in the bottom-up frame, framework. Um, in both these cases, it's rare that a designer use any of these methods exclusively. Now, all this being said about different ways to define design and how to create design, I should mention that throughout the rest of this unit, we're going to primarily be using kind of a, a, a top-down, phenomenon-based design approach. And that's because it makes it a lot easier to, to consider what's going on. But from a kind of sociological perspective of how to build models and from a perspective of what's the most comfortable way for you to actually create your models, it may be different than this approach, right? Uh, but it's best, it's easiest to explain this in kind of a more formulaic way. So um, in, in the next video lecture, we're going to start talking about exactly how to go about that design process.